Hello everyone. With uh, this lecture we will cover module 13 in our course CON8413. The topic is additional requirements for high buildings. First and foremost you want to make sure that you print out or at least download to your laptop the course notes that correspond to this topic which is module 13. Don't simply access them through Brightspace. You never know when Brightspace may not be accessible. Download them to your laptop now. Even better, print them out if you can. Also, do the same for the homework and the solution that comes with this. Okay, so that should be worksheet nine for homework and solutions. Great, let's get started. For today's topic, we're basically going to look at whether or not there are additional requirements for high buildings, uh, but even more importantly, how high is high? Uh, specifically, how do we determine whether or not a building falls under the requirements of section, uh, subsection 3.2.6 of the Ontario Building Code? How do we determine this vertical distance of height that defines a building as high? Okay. So, what buildings must conform to 3.2.6? Well, there are specific type of buildings that meet a requirement, a height requirement, and the height is calculated as the distance between the average grade all the way up to the floor level of the top story. Again, the distance is the vertical distance between average grade and the floor level of the top story, not the ceiling level of the top story. So basically, you're measuring the vertical distance between the outside average grade of a building and the highest point where people will be standing. So that is the floor level of the top story. Now here's what the sentence 3.2.6.1.1 actually says. Okay, and I'm paraphrasing. High buildings for this subsection depend on occupancies as follows. For groups A, D, E, or F, if the building is 36 meters high or more between grade and the top floor level, it's considered a high building. If it is 18 meters high or more, then you must use this formula that's described in words here. Okay? Now, I'll let you read it. You can refer to it in your building code, but I see a 1.8 and a 300, exit stairs, that sort of stuff. How about we actually practice how to use this in a moment, okay? But basically what this says is that for occupancies A, so that's all A's, D, E, and all F's, if your building is more than 36 meter high, it's considered a high building under 3.2.6. If your building is less than 18 meters, it's not a high building. But if it's between 18 and 36, you must use a specific formula that's written out in words in the building code, but you and I will go over as part of this lecture. Graphically, these requirements are illustrated in this image, which is also reproduced for you on page one of the course notes. So make sure you're familiar with this graphical representation because it will be very important and helpful. Notice how the height is shown going from the grade outside to the top floor level of the top story, not to the top of the building. Okay, here's an example. This example is visible for you on page two of your course notes. I'll read it out loud uh, while you follow along. The following is a typical floor plan for an eight-story office building. The typical floor-to-floor -floor height is 3600 millimeters or 3.6 meters. Average grade outside is 300 millimeters or 0.3 meters below the ground floor level. Assume the total exit width for each floor 
is the minimum required by code with stair risers at 145 millimeters. So this last sentence basically refers to uh, exit widths, which we've learned how to calculate under modules 12, I believe, 11 and 12. So you should be familiar with this already. And if you don't remember it, just go over module 12 and the homework associated with it. What do we need to do? We need to figure out whether according to 3.2.6, this building is considered a high building. The layout of a typical floor plan is illustrated at the bottom and it measures 65 meters long by 30 meters wide and I'm seeing two exits uh, for this public corridor. So let's do this. First, I want to point out the relevant items that stick out. One, this building is eight stories tall. Important, eight stories tall. Two, occupancy, office building. Three, the typical floor to floor height, 3.6 meters or 3,600 millimeters. Four, average grade is 300 millimeters below ground floor level or 0.3 meters below ground floor level. Okay, let's make it happen. Here's the solution. First of all, based on its occupancy, this would be group D. Now, if we measure or calculate the vertical distance between grade and the top floor, it's this. 3.6 meters, right, which is the typical floor to floor height, times seven stories, not eight, seven stories, because we're going to the top floor level, okay? Not ceiling level, top floor level, plus 300 millimeters or 0.3 meters of grade gives us a height, a vertical distance of 25.50 meters. 25.5 is more than 18 by less, but less than 36. So this building may be considered a high building and we must use basically the formula to figure out whether or not this works. So let's play around with this formula. This is what the formula basically says, okay? It's a fraction where the numerator is this. It's the occupant load per floor, which we already know how to do, but we'll do it together again, times the number of floors or stories above grade minus one divided by, all of this gets divided by 1.8 times the width in meters of all exit stairs, not just one, but all of them. So let's do this. The occupant load per floor, if you remember, you already know how to do this because you rocked the heck out of it in assignment, in assignment one or test one. It's the area of that floor plan, so 30 meters by 65, divided by the factor you find from a very specific table in the building code. Remember this table? Great. The factor from that table for office is 9.3 meters squared per person. When you do this calculation, you get a total occupancy of 210 people to the nearest person, okay? The minimum width of each stair is calculated, first of all, by determining how many people are going to use each stair. On the floor plan, which is also visible on your course notes on page 2, there are two stairs. So we take 210 people divided by two, that gives us 105 people persons per stair. According to 3.4.3.2.1c, right, if you remember from module 12, the factor per person is 9.2 millimeters per person. So we take the number of people, 105, times 9.2 millimeters per person, and that gives us 966 millimeters to the nearest millimeter. Now we have to compare this against the absolute minimum requirements of the building code, which in this case is 1100. So between the two, you pick the largest one, which is 1100. So that means each stairway, each exit stair 
is 1100 millimeters. So now we fill in the unknowns in the fraction above, right? The numerator, occupancy per floor times floor above grade minus one. So we get occupancy per floor is 210. Number of floors, eight minus one is seven. Again, remember, we're going only to the top floor, not to the ceiling of the top story. And the denominator is 1.8 times all the exits. So two exits times their width. So this is the total width of the exits. If there were three exits in the floor plan, this would be three times this distance. If there were four exits, this would be four times this distance. The numerator is 1470, denominator 3.96. What do we get? 371.2. Please do the calculation and make sure you can get the same number. This number is greater than 300. What does that mean? For this type of building, D occupancy, it is a high building. Okay? Now, the thing about high buildings and why we're actually going through the process of figuring out whether or not a building is considered high according to 3.2.6 is because high buildings typically translate into high dollars, okay, high cost, because a whole bunch of new requirements come into play if a building, say, you're developing or as a result of renovations gets considered a high building. Therefore, sometimes it may be helpful to make some changes to, say, the floor plan or the layout of your building to avoid this high building classification. For example, in the previous example, what if we increased the number of exit stairs, right? So we kept everything exactly the same, eight stories, D building, exit stairs at 1100 millimeters, but instead of two, we had three. Notice how this three makes the denominator larger and the whole number smaller. See if you can calculate this same number. Because it's less than 300, now it's no longer a high building. Or what if we make the stairs wider? Notice how now that number changes in the denominator so that the final answer is 292. That two is less than 300 and this building is no longer considered high. And again, don't forget, and go through your course notes to review this as well. The whole point of this formula is that it works, or it's, it's supposed to be used only for A, D, E, and F buildings that are between 18 and 36 meters, okay? All right, what about the other occupancies like B or C? Well, if it's more than 18 meters, it's considered high. There's even a more specific case right here. If you have a group B, two or three above the third story, it doesn't matter what the height is at all. It's considered high right away. Now, if a building conforms to 3.2.6, all of these requirements now come into play. Another way to say it is this. If the building you're designing or working on is high, it must now comply with these additional requirements, which translate basically into higher safety standards and higher cost, of course. You don't have to know these. You're simply meant to know that these exist and are a direct result of classifying a building as high. So it's an FYI. I promise not to test you on these, the ones shown on this slide. Now, worksheets are now visible. We're gonna move on to module 14 with the next set of notes. Uh, I'll provide maybe a link to that video in the description below, but this is important don't forget to print out or download the course notes that relate to this video. That's module 13 and the homework that relates to this. So that's worksheet nine. 
the solutions are also posted for you okay they're all written with the assumptions that you're simply doing this work on your own okay with no support you can do it rock the heck out of it try it out and that way you'll be able to rock the heck out of test too thank you for your time